Hello, friends. This is Don. Um, glad to be speaking to you for a little bit. I, you know, wish we could do it in person or at least live, but between schedules and time zones and death viruses, uh, here we are. But thanks for thanks for taking the time. So I'm going to do kind of two parts here. Um, the first, I'm going to tell some of my favorite stories from Shell of an idea, the untold history of PowerShell. Um, just about four or five kind of cool things I think people don't know about the Shell, really kind of give you some insight into where it came from and why it works the way it does. And uh, we'll conclude with just a little bit of career stuff because I'm actually working on a new soft skills book for Manning. Uh, and I, it's a good fit, it's top of mind for me. Um, keep in mind, you can always connect with me at Concentrated Dawn on Twitter and would certainly love to hear from you. So this is, this is my agenda. Um, I'm not gonna do slides because I hate slides. So let's just jump in. Um, I think the first thing that a lot of people don't know about PowerShell is AMSI, A-M-S-I. And this is something that Lee Holmes, who's a, a member of the team back in the day from the beginning, uh, really a security kind of, you know, oriented fellow came up with. And it stands for Anti-Malware Scanning Interface. And, and I want to get into a little bit of the history of why this thing exists. So, you know, back in the day, uh, we all know that VB script was a thing and it was a problem thing in some cases. A lot of people used it to write viruses. And the PowerShell team knew that, that eventually PowerShell would be used that way too. And so, they looked at how the anti-malware vendors had jumped onto VBScript. And what they wound up doing, so if you're an anti-malware vendor, you would, you would hinge on uh, the VBS file name extension or something like that. And when you saw that file, you'd open it up and they would try to parse the code and they, they would actually write their own VBScript engine to execute the code and see if it did something that looked bad or they would have signatures for bad scripts. Well, really, really quickly, the, the script kiddies got wind of that and they started doing weird encoding tricks with VB script so that you would open the script and it's just gobbledygook. Well, it puts the vendors in a bad situation. Like you can't, you can't just run the script and see what it does, right? Because that would be bad. But if they're writing their own VB script engine, like now they have to maintain parity with this thing Microsoft is producing. And it, it was just ugly. It was slow. I mean, I'm sure you've seen really, really poor performance from malware back in that, or anti-malware scanners back in the day. Now, Lee wanted to do something really, really robust, but they had already been through this whole, you know, monopolistic antitrust situation. So he knew that whatever they did, they needed to open it up to everybody. So that everybody who was, who was doing anti-malware software could play along. And that meant they couldn't just put something in Windows Defender. They had to put something into Windows that exposed itself as an API and Defender could use that, but so could anybody else, right? That way they weren't, you know, getting into monopolistic things again. So what he came up with eventually was known as the anti-malware scanning interface. And it's actually, so when an anti-malware sees a PowerShell script, right? Maybe it's hinging on the PS1 file name extension. It actually uses this interface to call PowerShell and say, hey, do a first run parse of this for me. Don't run anything, but if there's encoded stuff or any tricky stuff, expand it out and give us the, the raw expanded version of this. And then the malware, anti-malware software can look at that and say, okay, this matches the signature for a bad one, or this is an okay one or something like that. So we had to work really hard to get the Windows team to buy off on that, but it's in use today. Like everyone uses that today. And the cool thing is that if the PowerShell team adds some new character or new command or a new way of encoding information in a script, it's all taken care of. The anti-malware software automatically gets to take advantage of that because it's actually PowerShell expanding the script and then handing it back to the, the anti-malware software without actually running the script. So I just think that's one of the coolest things in PowerShell that almost nobody knows is there. And it does so much to improve performance of malware scans. It does so much to ensure that your anti-malware software can notice, can, can identify bad scripts. Um, There's just really cool little bit of architecture in there. So the next one I wanna talk about, and I wonder if I have a marker here. Well, I'll just use my pen. Cause I, I need a whiteboard, but I don't have one. And I don't know how to use the one in Zoom here. PowerShell was originally designed to have multiple pipelines. Now, you probably already know that it kind of does have multiple pipelines, right? There's the success pipeline, verbose, warning, error, debug, and information. So the current versions of PowerShell, you've got six pipelines. But that's not what I mean by multiple pipelines. 
Originally, they had intended you to be able to spin up your own pipelines and even make them recursive. So if you can think about it, you might have a pipeline running some commands and passing data down the line, right? And at some point you might, that's, I really do need a marker, okay, hang on. Okay, this is a tricky bit about working in a home office. Let's see if any of these work. You want to see it this way. All right, so you've written this pipeline. Yeah, that's better. And you've got a couple commands and they're passing data to one another. And then imagine, imagine a command like where object, right? Today, that simply decides if objects continue down the pipeline or not. But what if it was able to say, you know what? Some objects are gonna go this way and other objects are gonna do that way and we're gonna have a bifurcated pipeline, right? And maybe this one's gonna continue straight on to the end because we like those objects or whatever. And this one can continue straight on to the end, but we're gonna put a loop in there. Meaning I'm gonna put objects in there and if I don't like them, I'm gonna do some processing with them. And I keep doing that until they meet some criteria and then they're gonna to get to the end and then we'll re-merge the pipeline. So if you can really think about the, the execution models, like that's just a really, really simple one. You could have, the idea was you could have as many of these happening in parallel as you wanted, each one taking different steps and different processes, massaging data, doing whatever. So this is one of Snover's original architectural ideas and it's a great idea. The problem is um, Word did not get around to all of the developers and the developer in particular who was working on the, the, the main pipeline execution model was thought he was just writing a command line utility and he wasn't thinking about all these different models and Snover kind of was off doing some other architectural stuff and didn't pay attention. And so by the time everyone looped back and saw that what they had was pretty much hard bound to be a command line utility and this whole idea of multiple pipelines they were so far down the path it would have been too expensive to go back and start over. They didn't have the time or the money. And so here we are. So it's a great idea that kind of never happened. Um, all right, so what's my next good story? So a little bit about the core history. I'm not sure everybody really knows why PowerShell came to exist. Um, there's a little bit of sneakiness, almost mutiny, and definitely some hijacking. So it's kind of an exciting story. So we got to go back to Oh, around the late, late 90s, I think, mid to late 90s. Intel at the time was designing all of their processors, so their, their processor architecture on Sun Microsystems Spark stations, Unix machines running Solaris, which was Sun's variant of Unix. And I mean, this wasn't like a great look for Intel, right? Like Spark stations used risk-based processors. They were not Intel processors. So Intel was using the competition to design Intel's core business uh, and they hated it. And they said, you know what, we, we wanna fix this. And so Intel CEO got together with Bill Gates and they said, look, we need some help. We think our hardware can do this, but we, we don't have an operating system that can do it. And so Bill said, yeah, you know what, we need to fix that. Windows can be that operating system. And they put some money and some people onto the problem. And um, this kinda was the beginning of PowerShell because what they realized is one of the big workloads that Intel was using was a bunch of K shell. So KSH, uh, corn shell scripts. They relied heavily on these. And so they said, well, you know, how can we fix this? And they, they grabbed a bunch of people from the services for Unix team and they supplemented the team and they kind of put it all together and they came up with something called Kermit, not the Muppet. Um, there's actually a children's book called Kermit the Hermit. So it's about a Kermit, hermit crab named Kermit. So K, Kermit, shell, uh, get it, K shell, corn shell. Anyway, it turns out Intel was sort of lying. Um, they, they had an idea. They were gonna use a Linux distribution and they were already in the midst of customizing it, but they kind of wanted Microsoft as a backup plan and they kind of wanted to just push Bill Gates' buttons a little bit. And so it, in the end, nothing happened, but what they were originally gonna do, what was gonna be PowerShell, what was going to give us all this amazing command line administration ability was just gonna be a port of corn shell. That's all we were, we were gonna get Unix on Windows. I mean, ironically, you know, all these years later, we have that, you can run bash on Windows now. Um, so, you know, all good things come around, I guess. But what happened next 
was Jeffrey Snover was, was, had been poking around and, and he had been hired to help Microsoft get over this command line administration problem. Um, another reason they knew they had a problem was when they bought Hotmail and Hotmail was a completely Linux based, you know, webmail system. Uh, and Microsoft wanted to port it to Windows and they had a white paper written up and that got leaked to the public. It wasn't supposed to, it was supposed to be internal only. And it was, I don't want to say brutal, but it was very frankly honest about Windows and its lack of, of scale because you had to push buttons to do everything. So the company knew it had a problem and its other enterprise customers had been telling it that. So they hired Jeffrey and the first thing they, they gave Jeffrey was a bunch of money and they said, you don't really get any headcount, but you know, go start cracking away at this command line issue. So Jeffrey spent a few million dollars hiring contractors to write command line utilities. And so, and that worked and they got a bunch of great command line utilities out of it. Um, you know, some of the AD commands that we, we use today still uh, ultimately came from that project. So, but he got to the end, he said, you know, this, this process of fixing this problem is not gonna scale if I, if I spend millions of dollars and get like 50 utilities. So about that time, he started really looking into Windows management instrumentation, WMI. And WMI was interesting in that lots of people at Microsoft were investing in WMI. They were populating the repository with stuff, but no one was using it. Yeah, it was difficult as an administrator to really get into it. Um, you could do some stuff with BB script, but it, it was a little suboptimal. And you had to know a lot about how the repository was architected. If you've ever tried to do WMI stuff in BB script, you know, bleh, it's hard. So Jeffrey decided to write WMIC.exe. And this was going to be sort of a meta command line utility. So for a few tens of thousands of dollars, he was able to write this tool that made it easy to get to all this functionality that was already there. And, you know, instead of spending millions to get 50 commands, he spent tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands to get thousands of, of command equivalents because now he had unlocked everything that was in the operating system. Well, he kind of caught wind of this this corn shell thing that was going on and, and, and realized that that team, you know, had, had kind of hit the wall. Um, Intel didn't want to fund this any further and, and it wasn't going to go anywhere. And he said, you know, here's the hardest thing to get at Microsoft, headcount, headcount and a mission. That team's got headcount. I've got a mission. I'm going to hijack them. And so he did. He convinced the program managers who were running the, the Kermit team that the right thing to do was to go a totally different direction. And that by creating sort of a meta shell monad and then using everything else that was already in Calm and Windows and the .NET framework and all these other things that had been written but were just hard to get to. So PowerShell would just be a wrapper around all this goodness, just as WMIC is really a wrapper around a, a smaller chunk of goodness. Well, everyone pretty much bought off on the idea and he managed to sell it to them. And that's how we wound up getting PowerShell instead of a corn shell port from Solaris to Windows. Um, I think it's one of the best stories to know because it tells you something about PowerShell. The point of PowerShell is to take a bunch of things that don't look the same and try to make them more the same. And if you really start thinking about PowerShell that way, it helps inform the kind of scripts that you're going to write, right? You don't necessarily need to do everything from scratch. Look, if something is out there and it works, it's just a little hard to use or it doesn't fit. PowerShell is a great way to put a wrapper around it to make it look more consistent, to make it fit, to make it more discoverable, to make, make it more you know, easier for people to use. And that's really what PowerShell is. PowerShell did not reinvent anything. Everything you do with PowerShell now, you could already have done. You could have done it in .NET, or you could have done it with a command line utility, or you could have done it with WMI, or you could have done it with COM, or you could have done it with you know, a billion other APIs that are in Windows. PowerShell didn't give you any new capability. It just exposed you to things that were hard for an admin to get to without getting into Visual Studio and, and writing some enormous application. So PowerShell brought all that developer stuff. All that stuff was already there. It just brought it to our audience and it put a consistency layer across it. It helped create discoverability. So as you write your scripts, the things to invest in, consistency with the rest of the shell, discoverability, help files, documentation, right? That's the value PowerShell brings. The functionality, 
is pretty much already there. So focus on investing in those things. Um, you know, there's, there's another great story uh, about how PowerShell kind of got to where it is. You gotta remember when, when you're creating a product like this, that's, that's brand new and it's never really been done before, you don't always know how it's going to land with your audience. Um, and I, I wanna point out Windows Mobile as an example. A lot of people loved Windows Mobile as users, but developers didn't. There's a lot of stuff developers didn't like about it. And because iOS and Android were already so huge for developers to invest in another platform, they really had to like it. And they, it wasn't universally loved from a developer's perspective. And look what that wound up doing to the product. Right? Might have been a great operating system, but with no apps, pff, no operating system. Like nobody wants the operating system. They want their apps. Well, the PowerShell team kind of intuited that. They, they knew that they not only had to make PowerShell appeal to administrators, but it had to appeal to developers because if no one was writing commandlets, those are our apps, right? No commandlets, no, then who cares? No, no PowerShell. Well, so what they did, is they actually sat down with developers and did what may have been the first usability testing on an application programming interface. And they asked a bunch of developers, look, sit down and write a commandlet. And they would watch what they did and they would watch the, the rabbit holes they went down to and they would watch you know, the questions they would ask and, and they would make changes. And they spent a ton, I mean, PowerShell version one was years in development and a ton of that time was spent doing usability testing on the commandlet API. And so when it launched, developers loved it. They're like, wait, 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 if I've already, if I've already got code, like if I have code to do stuff and it's in .NET or COM or something else, all I have to do is like this, 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 and this, and boom, I've got commandlets and now administrators can use my stuff. I'm in, that's no work at all. That was smart. One of the best ideas PowerShell had was the PS providers, right? The idea of writing a, an adapter that could make almost anything look like a hard drive. Um, admins know how to use hard drives. It's, it's a great way to explore data. That's what the file system is. It's a giant hierarchical database and it, it stores blobs and metadata and everything else. And, and almost anything can be made to look like that if it's a data store of some kind. But they didn't do any usability testing with the PS provider API like they did with commandlets. And writing a provider is, uh, it's kind of non-trivial, it's hard. Like there's a lot of things you have to account for as a developer. And it's not just, hey, I've already got a great database. I should just be able to put a thin layer and now everyone in PowerShell can use it. And it wasn't like that. It wasn't a thin layer. Providers, they're still hard. Um, Ken Hansen, one of the, the program managers from back then, longtime program manager, um, says, you know, I, I wish we'd had the time and the budget to do more usability testing because I think providers would have been more impactful and unlocked more things for people if we had made them more approachable to developers. Um, now you do have projects now like Jim Christopher's ships project that does make it easier. Like he does some of the heavy lifting for you, but you know, that didn't come out till well in. And, and by then everybody had kind of shifted over to the commandlet model versus the provider model. Um, so it's just another interesting thing that, you know, mistakes are made. Um, sometimes amazing things are, are done. Sometimes, you know, you just don't, you don't have the time and the budget to, to do it every single time. Um, but it's one of the reasons that even now providers are, you know, they're just so-so. They're a great idea, but they're hard. And so they don't catch on. So I think the last story I want to tell um, is about, oh, you know what? Let's talk about where object. Let me get my whiteboard back out here. So I want you to think what, hap what would happen if, if where object looks something like this. Um, for a second. And I don't know if I need to unmirror. Let me let me hit my video. I don't, I don't know if you're seeing this right. So let me do my video settings. Um, and if that didn't work, then that will. Boom, one of those two. So you're looking at a pipe. So we're piping something into this, then where, and then the parameter minus expression. And then in quotation marks, some property, right, this, and then your operator, and then whatever you're comparing it to. So just as a general model, I want you to consider that. That's what where object was going to look like. Um, I have to remember my video because this freaks me out to look at, sorry. So I don't know if that affected what you saw in the recording or not, but you can let me know. Um, anyway, 
that's what our object owners looked like. It was quotation marks. And as they dug into it and they started implementing that, they realized it was really hard. Like they were running into just a lot of, you know, it seems easy to parse that, but when they're looking at it, they're like, oh man, you know, this could be one of 15 different things and we've got no way to tell it from, hey man, this is gonna be hard to write. And Jeffrey Stover credits Bruce Payette with switching us over to where we are now. And it's where object minus filter script. And then you get the curly brackets and then you put an expression in there and you can use dollar sign underscore to represent the object that's being piped in. And, and we're all used to that now. We know that now, we're, we're all familiar with that syntax. It's been around since, since you know 2006. But the idea of turning that quotation and that very SQL-like expression language and going instead with curly brackets, which represent a sub-expression and calling that a script block, like that is an executable. PowerShell runs that as a script in a pipeline that it spins up when it sees that command and it feeds in the object information to dollar sign underscore, and then we can do all kinds of stuff with it. Like a lot of us just do it for simple comparisons, but you could have an entire thousand line script within those curly brackets. That created the concept of a script block, and it is pervasive in PowerShell now. You write an advanced function, you've got the begin, process, and end script blocks. That's where they came from. You've got for each object, and it has a minus script block, and we use the curly brackets on that, that's where that came from. The idea of a script block being an atomic little thing that can even be assigned to a variable, and that variable then represents that script and you can execute it, that was, that was a big deal. Like that's everywhere in PowerShell now, and, and it all came about because where object ran into parsing problems with the original syntax they had. So again, I think it's a fascinating story. I think it's so worth understanding these things because it starts to unlock just little bits of, 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 of synergy. Like once you kind of know a few of these stories, you realize how, how the shell fits together and how it came to be. So, uh, you know, one more plug, boom, shell of an idea, the untold history of PowerShell. It's available on beanpub.com and it's available on Amazon, hopefully in your region. I'm pretty sure it's available in, in most regions. Um, but if you're an ebook person, then boom. This is the hardcover, by the way. Um, we, I, don't, I only made 100 of these. These are gone. Um, but the paperback looks just like it. It's you know pretty sizable, hefty book. Oh, and it's uh, every time I'm really proud of this. Every chapter just about starts out with a fantastic cartoon because there's fun cartoons as well. All right, I want to talk about one more thing before we go. We're going to switch topics and I want to talk about your career. Um, as I mentioned, I'm writing a, a book for Manning called Soft Skills. And obviously a lot of you know, I, I wrote a book called Be the Master. Soft Skills is kind of the successor to that. Be the Master has been discontinued at this point. Um, everyone who ever bought a copy on LeanPub will receive an email. If you're, if, in fact, if you did buy a copy, go onto your uh, LeanPub account and make sure that it is allowed to send you emails when I update the book, because that's how I'm going to send you an offer code if you wanna get a discount off of the, the successor book uh, from Manning. And, you know, one of my messages, and it's something I had to really refine down for this book, because Be the Master gets a little long-winded about it and, and heads a different direction. But, well, I, I guess there's a better way to do this. When I came up through the industry, um, I was just like most people. I didn't go to college. I came out of an apprenticeship program for aircraft mechanic. Um, so I worked on, on Navy jets. But coming out of that is, is a lot like coming out of college in that I had no idea what to do or where to go. Um, I knew I liked computers, but I had been told, <laughs> I had been told by my high school guidance counselor that I didn't do math well enough to get into computers. Um, so thank you, sir, for that fabulous life advice. Anyway, I uh, worked in retail for a while for a company called Electronics Boutique, EB Games, um, primarily US-based retailer, video games and stuff. And eventually um, I was a store manager and they had an opening at the home office and I uh, wanted to take it because it was an opening into their IT department and basically doing support of their point of sales system, the cash registers. Um, I got there and I had an opportunity to learn how to do AS 400 operations. So I took that and we upgraded, upgraded, loose term to an OS2 based point of sale system that sucked. I mean, it sucked hard. And it was such a problem for us. I, I, I bragged to my, my CIO one day. I said, you know, if we ever get snowed in for a few days, I'm going to rewrite this thing in Visual Basic and we'll have our own point of sale system and we won't have to deal with this crap anymore. Um, and we got snowed in 
and I rewrote it in VB script and or VB, VB4. Uh, I ran on Windows 95, and that's what the company used, variations of that and successors of that um, until they were uh, purchased by uh, GameStop, uh, which just acquired the company. And I was kind of always looking for that next thing. You know, what's my next thing? Um, Want to make more money? You know, maybe better have a better schedule. I worked night shifts, hated night shifts. I left EB and almost entirely over the night shift thing. They refused to move me on day shift. Um, they still needed that nighttime point of sale operator. I'm like, I'm writing all your code. Like I'm, I'm getting paid like 23,000 a year for God's sake. And I wrote this whole thing. Nope, night shift. So I left. Um, next company kind of was always looking for the next step up. They were a, a network consulting firm. And so every major certification I attained, I got more money. Cool. So I did three or four of those, got me MCSC, my CNE, my, I don't know, whatever else, Compaq, ASE, blah, 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 blah. Um, found a position at Bell Atlantic, got a couple steps up there, but I was always looking for the next thing. And it honestly wasn't until about four or five years ago that I started to feel the pressure of that. So I'll be 49 in a, a few days. So I was probably early 40s when it started to, to like weigh on me. Like, I, I feel I've, I've done a lot with my career, but like, when is it going to be enough? You know, it gets hard, the hard, the, like the higher up you go, the more successful you are, the harder it is to find your next success, your next move. You, you know, if, if you're a vice president in a company, like the pyramid got real small, there's not a lot of step ups. And it started to really weigh on me. I'm like, should I, should I go to college? I actually looked at, at an online university. I was going to drop big money to get an MBA. Um, so, I mean, first I had to get the bachelor's degree, right? Cause I didn't go to college um, because I felt, you know, that MBA is, that's my only way forward. Like if I'm going to step up and it just, it started to really weigh on me. <clears throat> and, and, and I think that's where a lot of the genesis of be the master came from is, is life and your career don't have to be a rat race. It doesn't have to be a constant lookout for, for what's next. Um, let, me, let me tell you the, the steps here. And then I'm going to tell you the most important skill you need to have in your entire career to keep you safe and fed. The first is forget your job, forget your career. Sit down and think about your life. What do you want from life right now? This is going to change over time. If you're a young person, you, you, you may decide to start a family, get married, do whatever else. And, and what you want from life is going to change. That's fine. This isn't a permanent answer. But I want you to sit down and really think about it. And, and almost write, I don't want to be morbid, but almost write your obituary. Um, you know, Joe, Joe uh, had a family. They lived in a nice house. They took good vacations. Write those things down and then start quantifying that. What's that house cost? You know, are you going to have two kids? Are, are, are you the dad or the mom that always makes it to every single uh, football game. I almost said soccer, sorry, rugby game. And if, if you are, what kind of time is that going to require away from work? What kind of work-life balance do you need? Start quantifying those things. I need this much free time. I need a job that lets me go at this time every single day. I need this much money. Write those things down. Those things, those quantifiable things, those things that you can observe, that is your success and you get to define it, nobody else. And it is not some intangible thing that you have to to endlessly chase after and go up and up and up and up and up. You know what it is. And once you've got it, you can stop. You don't have to run the race anymore. Once you've got what you need, all you have to do then is maintain it. So think about yourself, define your life. Who are you and what does life look like? And that's your goal, quantify it. That's your success. Now, instead of just chasing the next title or the paycheck or, or whatever it is you think you might be chasing, don't make any move unless it aligns you toward that success. Like, okay, yeah, you want, this is a step in the right direction. I, I recently had a job offer, very exciting job, but I was looking at the scope of the job and the company that it was for versus what I'm doing now. I felt, you know, I've had some frustrations at work. We all do happens not every day is perfect, but to do this job does not feel like a step toward my success. It feels like a step away from frustration. Never step away from things. Never run away from something in your career. Always run toward something. Make deliberate, thoughtful decisions. The GPS analogy, 
your success definition, those bullet points of quantifiable, objective, observable criteria, that's the destination you punch into your GPS and then every turn you make is to get there. Um, sometimes it can seem circuitous, that's fine. Like life's not perfect. You take what opportunities you can, but, but aim yourself toward your success. And once you're there, you just have to maintain. And let me tell you the most important skill in your career. Because remember, your, your employer owns your job, right? They have to give you the tools needed to do your job. They don't have to give you anything past that. They do not own your career. Your career is what gets you your next job. And it's on you to pay for that career, to feed it, to nurture it, to help it grow, and to take care of it. And the way to do that is to be a lifelong daily learner. Your most important skill is your ability to quickly learn new things and be comfortable with that. Be comfortable saying, you know what? We're, we're switching everything over to Linux or Windows or something else. I'm fine with that. I don't know anything about it, but I mean, I learned all that I know now, therefore I can learn more. And I might look a little stupid while I'm doing it because I'm gonna make some mistakes, but that's fine. I'm willing to learn. You have to exercise your brain. Cognitive science tells us that if your brain is used to learning, it will do it more easily. It's just like going to the gym, right? If you're used to picking up heavy stuff, picking up heavy stuff is easier. If you're used to running you know, 80 kilometers, then it's easier to do that. If you're used to learning anything, then it's easier to learn. I make a habit of reading the, I go to Wikipedia every single day and I hit the random article link. And I'm not really care much about the factual accuracy of what I'm reading. I just wanna learn something new. I want my brain to have to parse new information. I make a point, I work for Pearl Sites. So I'm very fortunate that I have free access to the entire library. I watch at least 30 minutes to an hour, three or four times a week, at least, because that forces my brain to learn. And I'm not worried about whether the topic I'm watching is, is on point for my career path. I watch software dev stuff. I watch machine intelligence stuff. I tend to watch like introductory stuff because it's high level and it explains to me what I'm looking at. And it, it's how I keep up and it's how I make sure I can always keep up. If someone came to me and said, you know what, we need you to take over the, the data curriculum. Okay. Like, I don't know it, but I can, because that's, that's my most important skill is I can, I can learn it. I can learn it confidently. So define yourself, define your success and be a lifelong daily learner. Make your brain learn. It will do it. It will do it. If you do it every single day, it takes it. I'm going to say about a month of that before it starts to feel natural. And then maybe another month before it starts to be eager. Like you want it, like you get, you're like a crack addict for, for just an, a learning a new fact or something. You'll become fascinating at cocktail parties if you pick your topics right. Or if you don't, you'll be dreary at cocktail parties. But either way, learn every day, every single day, including weekends. A random article on Wikipedia isn't gonna take up much of your time, right? You can do that in the loop. So I hope that was a little bit of fun. I hope there was a little bit of, of interesting PowerShell story in there. Um, you know, I, I don't work with PowerShell day by day anymore. And honestly, I, I really only ever taught the entry level stuff. So it's always a little intimidating to go to a user group because I'm like, well, I'm not gonna teach them how to do functions because they probably know how to do that already. But I am really into these backstories and um, you know, I, I, I am really, really into career management and owning your own career and really being the driver in your own life. So. Again, thanks for your time. Uh, I hope you are going into a holiday season that is a little bit better than the, the dumpster fire that the rest of this year has been. I hope you and your family are as well as you can be. And um, please do keep in touch. Take it easy.